Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Well, I am Jim. I'm an alcoholic. I'm really... I don't look like an alcoholic, do I? I'm not supposed to be an alcoholic. My folks did not say, look, we're going to make you an alcoholic. My folks said, we're going to make you a Southern, Southern Baptist. Now, you all probably don't know what they are. But they're the real ones, you know? You know, we're the ones that pray for the Catholics. Well, we're afraid they're not going to make it, and they drink, you know. <laughs> Presbyterians, of course, hell, they just knew it was going to happen. And the Episcopalians, they just got tired of being Catholics. Methodists, of course, they just didn't like water. I think I'd like to be a Lutheran. They believe in doing everything just a little bit. <laughs> Out in this... In Texas, you got 254 counties, and 250 of them are dry, which means we don't sell it, we don't believe in it, we don't even we don't believe in anything. Anything feels good, watch it. We we would not have believed in having children. We couldn't dance because you get close to women. And if we'd had this envelope deal, we never would have had children the way to do it. We just don't believe in doing it. And if you do do it, we talk about you. And we'll kick you out if you get bad. And they raised me on this Baptist bench and had the guy stand up here just like me. He said, if you think it, you might as well have done it. Hell, I knew I must have thinking it. Even though I didn't know what it was, I know I must be thinking it. And they point your finger at you. We're going to sing this last stanza for that one right back there. And they point right at you. You know, it's not like A.A. A.A. says, well, so Bob landed this last night. He lives. We'll get him. And this bunch, they just hone in on you. They know what the deal is happening. You're going to start, they start to see the gleam in your eye. They know next you're going to think it, and then you're going to do it. And they, they can't stand to see anybody do it. So one day after school, well, I got to be about 13, which will happen to you if you do what I was doing one day at a time. <laughs> I got in this car with this girl and got those funny feelings. And I told them about it. They said, we've been meaning to talk to you. I knew they had. You know we've been praying for you. Yeah. We want you to meet me before the funeral of service. So I met them before the service. They said, what you need to do is get saved. I said, what from? Have done nothing. And I said, well, I said, what? They said, when they make the call this morning, come down the aisle. So when they pointed at me, I came down the aisle and I was scared and my throat hurt. And it's kind of like a head, except don't give out any chips. They hug you and kiss you and tell you how great you are, and you know you're not, but hell, I liked it. And they put you in the tank, and the hank just leaks, and you choke a little, but you come out all right. Went to school the next day and saw that girl, came right back. I said, well, I guess we're going to have to do it again. It didn't take. They said, no, you just don't do it. Well, they didn't know. I didn't know how to don't do anything. I didn't know I didn't know I don't do anything. I didn't know if they'd just say, don't do that. They didn't do it anymore. I said, well, how do you don't do it? Don't think about it. I said, I wonder why I didn't think about that. <laughs> and I thought, well, it's 2 o'clock now. Then I'll just go ahead and think about it today. Then tomorrow when I get up, hell, I won't even think about it anymore. Got up the next day and thought about it more than I ever thought about it before in my life. <laughs> I had no idea that I'm the kind of guy when I start not to do something, I'm going to do it all the time. When I start not to think about it, that's all I'm going to think about. I used to try to wake up real quick before I thought about it. <laughs> Finally got out of high school, had to go to summer school to get out of high school. I don't think I was dumb, I was just busy. You know, we're tied up a lot. You know, a guy said, I passed you in the car yesterday, and you didn't even speak to me. I said, I was having a meeting. 
You said there wasn't anybody there but you and us and Ryan. <laughs> they don't realize that we have group meetings just by ourselves. I heard about this town that was 30 miles away that was wild and wicked, so I got my buddy, and I said, next Saturday we're going to go over at this town, and we're going to go and find out what they do in these beer joints. And I'd heard about them, and that's why I knew you could do it during the week. So we slipped over there on Saturday afternoon and walked in that beer joint, and my Lord, there was that deacon with a warm girl in one hand and a cold beer in the other. I said, my God, let's get out of here. He'll tell Jesus on us. And we didn't even get to do it. You know, if you get caught before you do it, you ought to forget it. This guy said, well, he can't tell anybody, but I knew he had a better shot with Jesus than I did. You know, I thought deacons were just sad. You know, I like the girl he was with on Saturday night a lot better than what he's with on Sunday morning. <laughs> and I'd see him on Sunday mornings, and I just thought deacons were sad. Now I know he was just tired. <laughs> We drank two beers, didn't taste good, didn't feel good, and I was glad to get out of there. Next day, I got up and wanted to go to church first time in my life because I thought, maybe I have noticed, maybe you get old enough, you don't have to go. There he was, sad like he always was. Then I had the, my first spiritual awakening. Maybe you can do it a little bit and just don't tell anybody. God, I couldn't wait to get to my buddy. I said, next Saturday, we're going to go back to Big Town, had two joints, went to the other joint, didn't see a deacon I knew, didn't see anybody I knew, walked in there, learned how to do everything but commit adultery. I'd have done that, but didn't know much about it. And you know how we are. I have to drink one beer and forget it. Think about it all day long. Then if we do, we don't know where we did or not. I didn't know I was getting ready to live a life of, I don't know. I learned how to drink, didn't even know I knew how to drink. You just drink one beer right after the other, get feeling as good as you can't feel at all. Learned how to dance, so the bad it's not allowed to dance. Fell down the dance floor, broke my nose, did it five times after I learned how to do it. <laughs> Blacked out just like I was supposed to. Waked up the next morning, threw up just like I'd been doing it for years. This guy called, said, how do you feel? I said, my God, I feel horrible. He said, oh, but you had a great time. I said, oh, well. <laughs> Then I knew how to get have a good time. Just go out and get drunk, black out, wake up the next one, throw up, then you know you had a good time. <laughs> Did not know you drank it any other way. I thought that people who didn't drink like I drank didn't drink. I just saw them put, I didn't even see them put bourbon in milk. I've never done it, never, I never, I don't, I don't even recommend it. The milk moved when they put it in there. <laughs> Some of them put fruit in it. That's where you get, they get all the acid from. I didn't make those mistakes. So finally, I'm over there one afternoon, and I'm by myself, putting off getting drunk. And I walked by this post office, and there's a sign out there that said, We need you. And I walked in there, and they did. <laughs> this guy said, Have you ever been to California? I said, No. I've been but 30 miles away from home. We're going tomorrow. I said, let me sign that deal. Then I went home to see my folks to tell them about the news. And my folks were already saying things like, Jimmy wants to do this. No, I didn't either. I didn't want to do it at all. Jimmy doesn't ever do that. Yeah, I do. Already done it once. Get ready to do it again. <laughs> they already knew what I wanted to do, and it was never, never what I wanted to do. And I was already not fitting in everywhere. I'd try to fit in with a group. I'd go places with the kids just so I could fit in with them. And they never liked me enough. And I couldn't get enough. I just, they just didn't like me enough. I just couldn't fit in. Couldn't get in. I went back the next day to this thing where I'd signed up. And I already told my folks. My folks are already looking at me funny when I tell them things. I told them they just look at me like a blank wall. And I'm going. And I went over there. And they went to San Antonio. I should have known then they was living one day at a time. And when I got down and sat, there's a funny bunch. They got up in the middle of the night, made their bed real quick. Somebody's coming. Never did. 
Then we'd go eat, even if you hadn't been drunk. Makes you sick eating that time in the morning. Not even daylight yet. Then they always walked in groups. Scared, I guess. And whoever it was running our outfit decided we ought to go on a surprise trip. So they didn't want anybody to know where we were going, so they couldn't tell us. And they thought it would be great if we didn't know where we were going. Some kind of game. And we were in the Air Force, so whoever it was decided we ought to go to China, and we went to China by boat. I think what they did, they flew the Navy over, and the Marines ran the boat. There's a lot of Chinese over there. (laughs) They have a few trees and a couple of hills and some rice, but they mainly just have Chinese. uh, (laughs) There's no smog or anything involved, and they just, they like to make Chinese. They're not it. They're not interested in getting into anything else. It's just, and they're good at it, and they like it, and they lose some, but they're making so many that, hell, it doesn't make any difference. Well, after you've been over there about three weeks, you've seen all the Chinese you'll ever need to see. So I told them I was ready to come home, and we stayed two years. Then we came back by boat. And then my folks wanted to know where I'm going to school. I said, my God, I couldn't get out of school and went to school. Failed in high school and had to go to summer school. I hate school, not going to school. If you don't have that piece of paper, you won't even be able to apply for a job, let alone get one. You'll have to have that piece of paper. I proved my folks wrong. I gutted that thing straight through three and a half years, and I didn't learn one single thing. I made sure up front before I took the course that I was going to pass it and that it wouldn't benefit a human being whatsoever. (laughs) You know what I like about you and I? We'll go to any length, even if it destroys us, just to be right. (laughs) A lot of people won't do that. A lot of people say, well, I could be wrong about that. Not you and I. The only time we'll ever use that statement is when we're damn sure we're right. (laughs) Then we might say, well, I could be wrong about that. (laughs) Well, I got out of school. I was very... I didn't mind working part-time. Then when you get out of school, they want you to work full-time. And on Mondays. And nobody should work on Mondays. That was my flu day on Monday. <laughs> and I was having some minor difficulties with women. If you put ten pretty girls up there, I'll get the sick one every time. I don't know where I learned how to do that. <laughs> I'd see some guys, they just go with any girl. You can't go with it, just any girl. you got to make sure you got a pretty girl that somebody you can take home and show to your folks and be in love with. You just can't go with any girl for God's sake, one girl one week, one girl next week. The only thing wrong with being the way I was is when you walk around with no girl and in love. It's awkward to do it. Take me about two months to find that precious, sick little thing. Then in about two more months, we'd be so much in love, I'd almost have to quit work. <laughs> then they just deteriorate from there on out. When I got into AA, I said, this, this is the most fantastic place I've ever been. It's the first time I'd ever been where they had the sick women group. <laughs> and I like both kinds. I like the ones that got sick doing it and the ones that got sick watching him do it. I don't know why that God seemed to have assigned us to make sure that all businesses operated according to our will. But it seemed like it was necessary for me to make sure everybody did right. And that's hard, doing your work and getting everything straightened out and keeping it going. Some of the places that fired me are still operating, doing it wrong. (laughs) Finally got out of a job and I couldn't get one. And the way I'd look for jobs, I'd get up every morning and I'd throw up and spray. 
Then I'd go fill out one of those forms that asked you personal questions like, where have you worked the last 10 years? It's not their business. <laughs> they want to know where you live. How are you going to remember all those addresses? <laughs> <clears throat> then the other blanks, you've got to say, wonder what they'd like for me to say. <laughs> they don't know them too well, you know. And then you just fail in the interview and go get drunk, and I did that. And I saved this one place after about six or seven days. I saved this one place that I knew they had an opening, and I knew the guy was there, and I knew I'd get the job. And I walked in there, and that guy saw me, and he said, oh, my God, you don't want this job. I said, yeah, I want that job. I got to have the job. I saved this place. I really wanted this job. You don't want this job. Also knew there's something about me he wanted to tell me, but he didn't know how to do it. And I also knew they was going to like it better when I left. So I went out and got drunk, waked up the next morning. I said, you know, I've been doing this for about 10 days. I think I'll just take the day off. So I went out to the golf course and ate an old egg, an old piece of toast, went around to the beer joint where my last spiritual advisor worked. And he said, my God, man, you look horrible. I said, yeah, I think I'm coming down with something. He said, my God, the way you're shaking, drink this beer. And I said, oh, my God, I'm Baptist. We never drink before noon. That's 1030. It's only 9 o'clock. He said, drink the beer. I drank half that beer and sprayed the golf course with it. I don't mind spraying if I don't lose my concentration. Start thinking about women or something, it gets your nose and burns. Then you got to drink, drink the rest of the day just to kill the pain. And I knew how to meditate before I got here. I never meditate that deeply anymore. It's just when it's me, God, and the commode. And you say, oh, God, and it's stringy. And you don't know where the end is. And you can't breathe. Because you get it all back. So you don't know whether you're staying or going. You know, another thing I always notice, even in the hot summertime, when you meditate like that, it's tiring. And you'd lean over there, and that bowl was always just as cool. <laughs> I told this guy, I said, I think I better go home and lie down. I didn't get to use the vibrators in these motels for two years after I was sober, because I could just vibrate all by myself. <laughs> and I left to live with me. I'd get up, I'd get up in the morning, I was supposed to call on hospitals, and I'd get in the car, and I'd go, I said, God, I hate to hit that old big hospital. Hard time to find a parking place, and then you got to take that kit, go through the lobby, and down through the wind down the basement, go see that purchasing agent, and you know him. Hell, he's not going to buy anything anyway. So you don't even need to stop. Just drive right on by. Wait till 1030, go to the beer joint, had another bad day again today. So I went home, and I got in the living room, and I decided that what I'd do is commit suicide. And those guys that didn't hire me would worry about it for the rest of their days. I was living in Houston then. I said, they'll see in the Houston Chronicle, Jim Williams commits suicide. They'll never get over it. I didn't know how to do it. Now I see it on television all the time now. Suicide, call that number. <laughs> they probably have pamphlets and everything about a group suicide. They lack like the courage to commit suicide. Come meet with us. I didn't like guns. This was even before overdose was popular. You know, we believed in the old turkey days. It's cold turkey. I, all three suicides, I was sound in mind and body. I just failed. That's all. An overdose, of course, you're just going to remember the pump. <clears throat> I didn't like guns of the morning because I don't like noise of the morning. And they splatter all over everything. Razor blades were popular then, but they didn't tell you what to do. They didn't tell you what kind of blade. Didn't tell you where, you know, where is your wrist? How long is your wrist? Which wrist? Where do you cut your, how deep do you cut it? No, no, and I had nobody to call. I knew you couldn't do it in the living room. You get blood all over the carpet. And I'm always thinking of others. <laughs> so I went to the bathroom, got my razor blade, and cut, I had sense enough, even though I'd never done it before. That if you just cut the left wrist, left side died, right side be alive. What if you backed out? Half dead, half alive. <laughs> well, I knew I needed to cut both wrists so I could die and bleed evenly. And I'm just sitting there on the throne listening to the drip. And the phone rang. And it was the police. And they said, 
where were you last time? I said, I was right here. And they said, oh, no, you wasn't. I said, how do you know? We was there. Then I didn't want to talk to them anymore. I'd already learned, don't ever talk to anybody no more about where you've been than you did. I said, well, what do you want me to do? He said, well, you can either come down here, we'll come back out there and get you. I said, I'll be right there. And he said, if I were you, I'd pick up an attorney on the way. And I said, that'll take me an extra 30 minutes, but wait for me. I'm coming. God, I love to live with me. I can live a week in a half a day. I've had a hell of a day. Been out to the golf course, ate breakfast, threw up, had a big meeting. And now I came in and committed suicide. Now I've got to call an emergency meeting, and it's only 11 o'clock. <laughs> so I decided I didn't like either one of those options that guy gave me. I thought, well, what I'll do is Houston hadn't been too good to me lately. I think I'll just leave town. So I had some little quilts and pillows and dirty clothes and clean clothes. I just threw them all. I had just room for me in the car. had one piece of furniture, an old lamp, and a lampshade. I guess I was going to carry the light if I could find the plug. <laughs> Got in the car and mailed a key to the folks that owned the place and ended up 108, had $36, which was plenty to start a new career before inflation started. Wake up the next morning about 180 miles away with $7. I said, I wonder how my folks are getting along. <laughs> it's amazing. Sometimes it's just get a burning desire to hear from your folks. So I called them collect so they'd know it was me. And my folks said, what are you doing? Where are you? I said, I'm in Brownwood. They said, what are you doing? I said, I'm oh, just out riding around. They said, why don't you come by and have a cup of coffee? I said, oh, believe well. I never shortchanged my folks. I always, they're not going to get their money back. So I always give them my very finest story. In fact, I got to listen to it. And it was so horrible, hell, I cried with them. <laughs> I thought, my God, if I'd have known that. I'd left Houston three years earlier. Finally, John says, well, old Jimmy's honest. Let him have a hundred. Huh. With a hundred and seven, you can almost go into business. I knew I just had to sweat that down out, so I sweated out, got up the next morning, turned around, and I said, Aunt Lee, there's one little thing I left out last night. While I was going through all that hell in Houston, I was drinking some. But I decided after last night I shall never drink again as long as I live. You'll never have to worry about my being underfinanced, and you won't have to worry about me anymore. Well, I got in the car, and I don't know where to go. And I've got $107, so why not take a little vacation? And I knew a guy that was in the Rio Grande Valley that I'd gotten a job down there. I helped him get a job about five or six years before that. So I said, I think I'll go down and see him. Just only a little old, found out it was a 10-hour drive. You know where it is. You all got some, just right down there south, they got a little creek. They change countries to get down there. It's almost the end. It is the end. If you really want to find your bottom, it's a good place. Right down there. It's... So I drove right out of Fort Worth, stopped at the first filling station, said, how far is to Waco? They said, 79 miles. They happened to sell beer. I said, let me have three. So I end up at the Rio Grande Valley, and I'm moved at this beautiful hotel where I had to park across the street. And for three solid weeks, I went down there where he worked every day trying to get a job. And every morning, I never took my clothes in. I'd come down the elevator, go over and get my shorts, socks, shirt, go up, take a shower, come back, did that for three solid weeks. They finally hired me. Now, they didn't hire me because they wanted to. They hire you because nobody goes down there applying for jobs. They just go down there to play at snow dodge. So they hired me, and for some reason, when I'd go to work at a place, if there was a guy in my place, early morning, I was an early morning man, well, then I'd have to move him over, get him fired, and move into his place. And I did that there. And I was there just a few months, and I could just get drunk and not drunk drunk. Well, I could get up and learn everything about the business. And this manager came over one afternoon when I was just too tired to go get drunk. I was going to rest about 30 minutes. And he came over and knocked on the door and said, you've been here almost eight months. I think we need to get better acquainted. I said, yeah. You want to have a beer? I said, oh, I guess one. He was a drunk, just like me. He and I lasted there eight years, and he screwed up, got fired. 
Then they fired me and the other drunk. I'm still trying to get married. And I figured out that what I've been doing all my life is wrong. I've been the kind of guy that just tries to go with one woman. Then when they go to pot, there I am in love with no woman. So what I need is a number one and a spare. My days are just like this. I worked Monday through Saturday noon, jumped in the car, ran to the golf course, had a heavy lunch like a six-pack of a cheese cracker, <laughs> got drunk, blacked out, in bed by 6.30, quarter to 7, up with dry mouth and all at a quarter to 11, 11 o'clock, then go down to my joint, finish it, and then close at 1 o'clock. Then we'd drive over to Madame Marsh and finish the evening. And then some mornings around daylight, we'd have Weymouth Run Cheros at the Texas bar and throw it up, or sometimes we'd just skip it and drink beer and taper off into Monday, and sometimes you made it, and sometimes you missed it. Well, this particular weekend, I decided to trade off with a guy, so I'm up and drinking on Friday night after 9 o'clock, which is late for me during the week, and I'm blacking out. And you know how we are sometimes. We're just so honest, some people can't handle it. So evidently, I had never mentioned to her about number two. So I just mentioned that I thought maybe I'd drop by and see her on the way home, but I wanted to go to the bathroom first, and she follows me in there. And you should never, you know why they're putting carpets in bathrooms now? Because people are insisting on having meetings in bathrooms. You should not have meetings in a bathroom. You need to meet out where you've got couches and carpet and beds. Don't meet in the bathroom. It's hard surface places in the bathroom. She followed me in there to discuss it. Now, I don't remember what happened, of course. The next morning, I'm living in an old faded green trailer behind a motel. I had the rock yards a long time before they started putting them in. Weeds had come up there, and I'd say, you'll never make it. <laughs> I've already learned to wake up in total fright in my own bed. And I'm laying there asleep, and something goes, wham! Jumped up there and looked down, still had my clothes on. I said, oh, my God, I bet I was going somewhere early this morning. <laughs> looked down at that old white shirt and had blood on it. Blood makes me sick, you know. And I'm in total fright. I know it's the police. I feel like, oh, I've got knots on the head. Uh-oh. Had a car wreck. I wrecked my car. That's police. I wrecked my car. They're coming after me right now. You can't get out of those trailers. Those little windows are about like that. They keep beating on the door, so I open the door, and there stands that 240-pound, six-foot-four Baptist preacher saying, come go along with me. I said, preacher, I'm sorry, I can't make it. Oh, I know I look like I'm ready. I don't know where the meeting is, but I can't make it. I just can't make it. I may look like I'm ready, but I cannot go. He said, get in the car. Go. Heads kill him, and I'm in total fright. And I look at my car, and it looks like it's okay. Park's funny, but it looks like it's okay. So I get in the car, and I said, preacher, I'm going to have to have a beer. I cannot make it. I'm not, I'm not breathing. I can't, I'm not breathing. You know what? Baptist preachers do not give a damn whether you're breathing or not. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to make it. I, wherever it is, wherever the meeting is, I am not going to make it. He said, there'll be no drinking before the meeting. We drove up in front of her house, and I assume it's going to be there. Heads killing me, got knots on it, little blood still coming. And we walked in, and she did look like she might have fallen in a bush or something. <laughs> and I said, well, I've got to go to the bathroom. And I went in that bathroom and looked in that mirror, and I'm going to tell you something. She won. <laughs> I probably will never know what happened. But what I think really happened, that I probably lost my equilibrium and fell in that bathtub, and she stepped on me. <laughs> Two weeks later, we got married. <laughs> we got married at the First Baptist Church, so it worked. We got married at 10 o'clock in the morning, so there'd be no drinking before the funeral, uh, ceremony. <laughs> I was up on Friday night again, and I told her that it wasn't necessary since she had been married before, and I was pure. It wasn't necessary for us to invite a lot of people, but she could have a few close friends. Well, I'm blacking out at 11 o'clock on Friday night, so I get on the phone and call till 3 in the morning. And I get to the church, 
And my beer distributor friend comes out and said, I'm going to tell you something. You called me at a quarter of three this morning. I just want to tell you, we didn't come here to see you get married. We came here because we don't believe it. And the longest bet in your marriage is three weeks. But I showed them. I hung it in there for eight years. But my life changed. I had no idea how nice it was to get up and throw up in peace. I was always going to quit smoking because it made me gag in the morning. So I'd grab those cigarettes and grab that coffee and go in that bathroom and lock that door, and she'd tell me what I was through that door. Then I'd have to get upset, go make the living, get drunk, come home and tell her what she was, and we did that one day at a time. Finally, I went back to that preacher, and I said, Preacher, this thing is not working. He said, You know what's wrong with you? You're missing the beauty of life. I said, Yeah. Did you know the fruit trees were in bloom? I said, No. He said, What you need to do is go home and get your wife and get in the car, drive up the valley, smell the aroma, and look at the blossoms. I said, Yeah. So I got in the car, went over the door and said, Get the car. <laughs> he said, what for? I said, we're going to go look at the blossoms. <laughs> she said, the blossoms? I said, yeah, we're missing the whole damn thing. <laughs> we get in the car, and I go by and get a six-pack, drive up the valley. She assigned says, 14 miles to Mount of Mars, turn left. Went to Mount of Mars, switched to tequila, blacked out, missed the whole damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> Lost that job, couldn't get one, went crazy, tried to find one for about two months. And a guy who managed a drug company that I'd been drunk with many, many times hired me. Took him about six weeks to send me to Fort Stockton, Texas. Now, that's west, west Texas. You got a little freeze out there about that high. You can see California on a clear day. <laughs> 536 people lived there, and 36 of them were making a living. I joined the 500. <laughs> I'm supposed to stand in a drugstore and help put a pad on my arm and write stuff like REO Bison, and you can't even spell it, let alone keep it in those lines. And I'm moving. I'm just moving. And that pharmacist says, my God, man, you look like you're going to fly apart. I said, any minute. He said, well, take some of these. This was for Valium. I understand Valium. You can both eyes crossed and you walk straight. This was just Librium, which is absolutely nothing. It's just a little green and black. little bitty green and black or two-tone greens. All it is, just nothing in it. I took a couple of them, and I waited 15 or 20 seconds, and nothing happened. <laughs> nothing burned or moved or did anything, so I took three more. And then my knees just went, huh? So God, I know how to weave. Now I've got to learn new stance. <laughs> I guess it can't do it anymore. It used to tickle me when the guy would say, pharmacist would say, I'm a little short, 10 milligrams. 25 be okay, I'll be fine. Same size. You know, alcoholics don't go over the milligram. We go over the size. <laughs> take 10 of one size, take 10 of the same size. <clears throat> Finally ended up a guy recommended me for a job back in Houston. They hadn't seen me in 10, 12 years. And I got that job, and I got back to Houston and moved into these apartments. And, oh, what's her name? And I had developed such a nice, sweet hate for one another that we were relatively safe because the one that died first won. <laughs> but we had... we felt like it was better and safer and best for all concerned if we had a separate bedroom, just in case, so we could sleep a little more comfortably. So we set up battle, and none of my customers saw me drunk for the first nine months, and then the day before Christmas Eve of 1965, I played golf with these customers and their in-laws and outlaws, and went over to their house and blacked out. There's nothing new. I'm a blackout driver. Never had a wreck blacked out. Lots of wrecks drunk. Never blacked out. Not a good drunk driver, great blackout driver. <laughs> and drank the blackout, went home blacked out, and I left their house blacked out, 
and went from one side of Houston to the other. It's nothing new for me. I'm a blackout driver, driven that way for years, and waked up the next morning in total fright, just like I was supposed to, looked out to see if my car was back. I didn't even quit asking it how it got back. Walk around with no new dents, no blood, and then I'd pick up the phone and call back and say, I sure am sorry about last night. I wasn't sorry about last night. I wanted them to tell me what I did, and they never tell you. And they don't have to make amends, so we'll never know. They just say, Jim, it was okay, you just got drunk. Drunk was getting to be a bad word for me. Things like, we can't have him, invite him anymore, we can't be around him anymore, because I can't stand him when he's drinking. So I was getting the message. I'm not an alcoholic. I guess heard on radio. I picked up the phone over what's her name and gone next door that's getting ready to have a Christmas Eve party. And I looked up under Alcoholics Anonymous and called in a group. Called that girl. I guess she's shacked like she's glad I called. I should have known then I had the wrong number. She said, somebody will be right out. Well, I waited an hour. Nobody showed up. It's 1015. Looked at the ice box. Had three beers. I said, I'll just call them back and tell them I don't need them. About that time, this phone rang. Guy said, I'll be right there. Before I could tell him I didn't need him, hell, he hung up. I said, well, I'll just get rid of him because it's, I've got some beer and it's Christmas Eve and no use talking to those people now. And he came by himself because he and his wife were managing these apartments when I moved in and they used to watch me going back and forth from 7-Eleven and saying, he lives, we'll get him. <laughs> and I looked out there and he looked like one of those deacons with a book under his arm and sour looking. And I said, oh, hell, we're going to read that book and pray. I've not only been baptized, I've been rededicated ten times. I'll just get rid of him. He came in. We didn't read the book. We didn't pray. We, I don't know what he said. I don't know what I said. About that time, old what's your name came back in. He said, do you want to go with me? Well, I didn't, but it's better to stand with her. <laughs> so I got in the car, and we hit that old 610 loop in Houston, and I knew then I'd gone off with a wrong, I'd gone off with a perfect stranger. I know better than that. He's not my kind of guy. I should have taken my car. And I said, well, I'll give him the test. I said, I'll buy a beer. I don't want a beer. I knew it, damn it. So I waited about 20 more seconds. I'm going to tell you something. I got bad drunk last night. And I'm going to tell you something. If I don't have a beer and have one right now, I'm quit breathing. I have got to have it. I got to have a beer right now. And besides that, it's 1120. He said, can you wait till we get to the club? Oh, yeah, I can do that. I can handle fright if I got a little light. And we drove, we drove over kind of a bad neighborhood and drove up in front of this old rickety-looking house. I said, this it? He said, yeah. I thought, well, when I get some money, I'll help these folks. <laughs> we walked in there, and some of those deacons were sitting over there talking about women in the stock market. We found out later on they didn't know a thing about either one. And they had an old bar back there in the back, and the bar said it didn't look a hell of a lot better than I did. There's a program of attraction, you know. Walk back up there, and that little deacon says, mix him up a little milk and honey. I said, my God, what do you put in it? I never drank anything like that in my life. He said, well, you see, you're nervous. I said, hell, that's what I've been trying to tell you. And he said, and besides all that, you're used to sugar in your system from alcohol, and the honey has already been digested. I said, indigestion's not my problem. You know, if you throw up right, you don't have indigestion. I drank it and drank about half of it, and it curdled and came right back up. He said, don't worry about it. We have plenty. I thought, hell, I want to put on a show for these guys. And one of the smart ones said, walk all you want to. I didn't want to walk at all. And there I was walking up and down. They said, have you got a new animal in here today? Watching you laughing and talking. Just watching you walking up and down and drinking that sweet, sweet, sick, sick. Ooh, almost tasted sick. Sweet. I hadn't had a piece of chocolate pie in ten years. <laughs> Finally, about four o'clock, I said, well, I guess we're going to go home. I said, yeah. I said, let me out about two blocks in the apartment. I was going to slip in and get my car because I knew I was going to have to get some bourbon because beer would not cut that sweet taste. 
He said, don't drink anything. I'm going to pick you up in an hour and a half. I said, what for? We're going to a meeting. I said, where? Right back where we came from. I said, my God, we was there all day. I said, well, just let me out. And I walked and walked, and here he comes, and back over there we go. It's kind of a funny bunch. I saw two or three of them kind of laughing and hugging and kissing. The rest of them, they didn't, like, they didn't look like they too damn happy to be there either. And then he got up and said a little old prayer. Some girl got up and talked two or three hours. They said just 30 minutes, but I know it's longer than that. And they just laughed. It wasn't a damn thing funny. Some guy got up and talked three or four hours. And then they just laughed. And I said, I'm going to tell you something. This is a sick bunch of people. <laughs> These people are in bad shape. This bunch is. Then they got up all hell, held hands. They said the Lord's Prayer. The Holy Spirit moved in there. Every one of them started talking at the same time. Nobody listened. I said, that thing just exploded. I said, I wonder how in the hell he did that. I said, I'm going to keep my eyes open tomorrow night. They didn't sing any songs, lay any hands. They didn't do anything. I'm going to see what he did. We were standing back there, me and this deacon. Nobody's paying any attention to us. And I'm already catching on. I probably got the wrong guy. Then I saw the deal. Men and women getting together, holding hands, jumping in those cars, taking off. I said, oh, well, after you hear a while, get to go over some of these apartments and have a little drink and talk about this damn thing. <laughs> we went night after night after night after night. Nobody invited us anywhere. One night it was just raining. It doesn't rain in Houston. just falls out. <laughs> and this guy called and said, Pick you up in 30 minutes. I said, it's raining. Did you ever go get a drink when it's raining? Yeah, I'll be ready. <laughs> then one night, oh, one weekend, oh, what's the name? And going back to the valley, see if we had any friends left. <laughs> so I just pulled out all the shades, turned out all the lights, had nothing on but the TV set. That old phone just ring, 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 let it ring. Next morning, he called and said, where were you last night? I said, I was right here watching television, enjoyed every damn minute of it, and I think I'm going to do it again tonight. He said, well, you missed it. I said, what did I miss? He said, I don't know. I said, wasn't you there? He said, yeah, but I only heard what I was supposed to hear. We'll never know what it was you were supposed to hear. <laughs> he said, my God, you got to go every night, you'll miss it. So I went three months, got drunk, three months, got drunk, three months, got drunk, and sobered up all by myself. And then I decided, for one of my special meetings, that the only thing wrong with me is I'm not an alcoholic. I have just always been underfinanced. So what I need to do is just get properly financed, then I can quit her, leave them, and I'll be okay. So I thought, do first things first. I've already learned some things. First thing you need to do is go back and officially resign and tell them thank you very much. So I start back, and evidently, some night while I was drinking, about 2.30 in the morning, which I doubt very seriously, they'll tell you anything, you know. They, they know they're lying. They've been here longer than you. And they'll tell you anything, I think, these big hot shot sponsors will. So he seemed to think that I called him some morning about 2.30. He's probably somebody else. So before I could... Resign, here he comes after the meeting, walking up there looking mad like he does half the time. Said, before I could tell him I resigned, he said, don't you ever call me again. I said, God, I'm glad you said that. I never called you in the first place. They called you. And I'm going to tell you something your best friends will not tell you. Nobody likes you here. We don't get invited anywhere, and they don't know me, so it's got to be you. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you another thing. If I had as bad a personality as you do, I'd go back to drinking. <laughs> and you'll never have to worry about me ever calling you ever again if you're the last human being on this earth. You'll never hear from me ever again. And I left, and he did until the next morning. And I called him the next morning. <laughs> One day at a time, right? <laughs> I 
I'd heard somewhere that every day was a new day. I doubt it, but they said it. And he said, meet me at the club. And I walked in the club, and he said, get your coffee and sit down. They talk to you like a dog here, you know. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you something about Alcoholics Anonymous, Al-Anon, Al-Teen, al tot and Al-Dog. <clears throat> There's absolutely no failure here. Has not, will not, never will, impossible to, cannot fail. There's just no failure here, provided you do exactly what we tell you to do the way we tell you to do it. He said, there's only one thing that you're going to get to do for the rest of your days. You're the only one that's going to get to do it. But this is the only one thing that you're ever going to get to do from now on out. You're going to get to decide every day whether you're going to go our way of life or your way of life. If you don't give an alcoholic a decision to make, they'll flounder on the same subject for years. <laughs> so we're going to give you a decision to make this morning. Whether you're either going to go our way of life or go right back out that door. I said, I don't want to do either one. He said, I didn't ask you what you wanted to do. I asked you what you were going to do. I said, do you mean tell me you don't care what I want to or not? He said, not at all. Group doesn't care? No. I said, well, you'll make it perfectly clear to the group that I don't want to do it. Then I'll do it. <laughs> he said, well, first of all, we've got to get some things straight. It's your thinking that's wrong. I said, how much of my thinking is wrong? We always start with all of it. <laughs> and if there's any, any good, we'll let you know. I said, you put a sign up there on the wall that says, think, think, think. And he said, that's for us. <laughs> he said, now we're going to give you some things not to do and some things to do. The things it's going to give you not to do is going to change. The things it's going to give you to do, you'll just add to. Then it's going to happen over here. I said, what's going to happen over there? We don't know, but it always happens. I said, I'm going to tell you something. I've been listening to every word you said. You never listen to me. And I want you to hear me. I do not understand. He said, and that's it, and don't you ever forget it. <clears throat> He said, there's two things that you must remember for the rest of your days. No matter what's going on in your life, you do not understand. Then you'll have understanding. And when you quit trying to understand, then you can enjoy it. And no matter what your situation is, it's never the situation. It's never them. It's never God. It's you that must become different. You must become different than you have ever been before. I said, how do I do that? He said, oh, you can't. I said, what the hell you tell me for then? <laughs> he said, that's what's going to happen to you. <laughs> he said, now I'm going to give you the kicker. This is the very one thing that got you here. But it's also the very one thing that, should it not change, will be the one thing that's going to keep you from getting all the things that God has for his children. As long as you know that you know, you'll never know. But when you begin to do what we tell you not to do and to do, and begin to know you don't know, then you'll begin to know. I said, hell, you're crazy. He said, I know. He says, now, since you don't know how to not do anything, we're going to, the first thing we're going to learn how to not do is learn how to not drink and take a pill. You know that card that I gave you that has my number and four other men, no women, no mine. When you get squirrely, definitely before you take a drink or a pill, you call that number no matter what time of day or night it is. Now, if you don't make the phone call, you didn't do it, even if you didn't drink. And that's the way we're going to learn how to not do something. And this is what we're going to do every day. When you get up in the morning, get down on your knees, then say these words and these words only. God, take me today. Let thy will only be done in my life. Help me to definitely not take a drink of anything alcoholic or a mind-changing drug. And let me be what you want me to be today. Amen. Do not need to tell God what he has not done. 
nor what he needs to do. God's highly capable of handling that all by himself. And then call me before you go to the bathroom. I said, why before I go to the bathroom? You may not need to go. I said, do you mean tell me you don't think I've got to say stuff to know that I need to go to the bathroom? He said, we'll find out. <laughs> they don't give you a lot of credit here, you know. Before I got out on my knees, I said, God, you and I know he don't know. Hell, he's a Presbyterian. And you know I've been praying to you all my life. But I'll tell you one thing. We're going to do everything just exactly like he says. So when we get enough of it this time, we can tell him to take this deal and shove it. I got down on my knees and I said that prayer. Got up, made sure I need to go to the bathroom. Picked up, told him he didn't ask where I need to go. And I said, go to the bathroom, meet me at the club. I met him at the club and he said, now I'll go to work. I said, I hate my job. He said, what's that got to do with it? I said, well, I hated it so much yesterday, I couldn't go to work. He said, what would you do, sit in that chair? And I said, yeah, at noon, then I went to the club. He said, you don't know how to go to work. I said, how? He said, go get in the car. He'll write that down, you can catch it. <laughs> then he said, later on, after, besides that prayer of the morning, we're just going to start with this one, and later on we'll learn how to do it in all areas of our day. I want you to invite God when you get in the car, invite God into the day. I said, how do you do that? He says, you say, God, I invite you into the day. Oh, put that on the car. If we don't lose a card, we can go home. Then you come back, and you know how they are. You walk in the door of the club, and they say out loud, so everybody will know you don't know. Go get your coffee and sit with us. Don't say anything. Just listen to the kings. <laughs> then you almost get settled down. They say, it's time for you to go home and eat supper and come back to the meeting out loud so everybody in the room can hear, because they know now that you don't have sense enough to go home and eat supper and come back to the meeting. And then I came back to the meeting, and then after the meeting, he called me over and says, now I want you to go home and get on your knees to the side of the bed and thank God for the day. I said, I do not thank God for the day. It's been a miserable damn day, and I hate you, and I hate AA, and I hate her, and I hate my job, and I'm not going to be a hypocrite. He said, do you feel like when you're talking to God that you don't mean it? I said, that's right, and I'm not going to do it. You do it. He said, that has absolutely nothing to do with it. It's only the action you're taking that you don't know you're taking that's going to cause the things to happen that you had no idea was going to happen. And all the things that you think has to happen probably never will need to happen. Because once you take the action you don't know you're taking, and the things that are going to happen that you had no idea was going to happen, what you thought needed to happen will never need to happen. Well, hell, I understood that, for God's sake. I said, do you mean to tell me that God does not care when I pray to him whether I mean it or not? He said, not at all. You don't care? The group doesn't care? Nobody cares? Nobody cares. Got my car, went home, locked the door so what's the name couldn't get in there. Got down on my knees and said, okay, by God, God, thank you for a miserable damn day. Amen. <laughs> hell, if he don't care and they don't care and God don't care, hell, I don't care. <laughs> Did that for about two months. And then one morning, I didn't do anything any different. Got up on that old 610 loop about 9, 15 that morning, and this God that I have never known is my friend moved into that car with me, and for the first time in my life, I knew I knew something different than I had ever known it before. I knew I knew I would never need to take another drink of anything alcoholic or a mind-changing drug unless I myself insisted upon it, and I knew I knew it. God stayed with me all that day. Good. It's gracious. I thought, man, the rest of my life's going to be just like this. About 3 o'clock that afternoon, I thought, man, I'm going to get me a tent and some tambourines. <laughs> and I'm going to go save some souls. <laughs> oh, Lord, better look out. Jimmy from Texas is coming. 
couldn't wait for him to get back to the club. He's 15 minutes late, and he walks through that door and says, Get your coffee and sit down. <laughs> the badness is taking over. Now, I knew, I thought, well, I might even let him go help put up the tent. Now, I knew that'd make me the leader. And they don't like it coming back, but he got his coffee anyway, but he didn't like the orders I gave him. And he came over on the other side of the club, and then I told him the deal. And he looked at me and grinned just a little, not a lot, and said, thank God we've got that over with. Now we can get started. <laughs> I said, my God, that took a year. He said, some are sicker than others. <laughs> I said, what are you going to do about old what's her name? He said, I'm not going to do anything. We're going to leave our marriage just like it is, and so I'll send you to a guy who's got his all worked out. God, he sent me to an Episcopalian. You know they don't know. And this guy said, do you remember when you got into Alcoholics Anonymous and you didn't fit in here and you didn't fit back out there and it was a lonesome period and you thought you were the only one that's going through it? I said, yeah. He said, I'm going to tell you something. If you're willing to go through those lonesome periods, in every area of your life. So I don't know how it's going to happen, nor when it's going to happen, nor how you're going to get there. But I'll guarantee your relationship with a woman that you've never dreamed of. I'll guarantee your relationship with your fellow man that you could never have imagined. And I'll give you a bonus on top of that. I'll guarantee your relation with Almighty God that you could never thought possible. I said, I don't believe that. He said, isn't that wonderful? I said, what do you mean? You don't have to. It's only the action you're taking. I said, I've already heard that. <laughs> he said, are you living with old what's her name? I said, not closely. She has her room and I have mine. And I said, I've had two or three girls that I'm sure were right for me, but they won't let me do it. And I'm having brain damage not doing it. Well, what are you going to do? You're not drinking for relief. <laughs> kind of like the guy says, I've just finally decided I quit my wife and I'm going to quit my job to find myself. I said, my God, I've never been where I didn't show up. <clears throat> God, I used to drive blackout, wake up the next morning 200 miles away from home. There I was. I didn't even know I'd gone. I made it. Well, I see, said, we'll just practice on old what's her name. You're never going to tell her what's wrong with her ever again. I said, who's going to tell her? <laughs> he said, I don't know, but you're not. And you're never going to get Alan on or anybody else to work her around or children or anybody to work her around to get her to do your way. I said, never. He said, never. And you're going to pray for her. And I said, I'm not. You pray for her. He said, yes, you are. And you're going to have to say this prayer many times a day during the beginning. Maybe ten or hundred. I don't know. Say this prayer all the time. God, thy will be done for her as well as for me. Take our relationship. Let it become what you want it to be. And show me the truth. I said, I do not want God's will to be done for her, as well as for me. He said, remember, what you want has nothing to do with it. So I started doing that. Wasn't too long that old sex, love, lust thing surfaced in me. Then I couldn't get rid of it. I told him four times a day, God and him, and God would not remove it like he should. So I told the group. And the girl in the group said, you're not supposed to tell that to the group. So I went over and told another group. And she said, you're not supposed to tell that to the group. So they snitched on me. We don't gossip here. You know, we're just concerned. <laughs> and right now, I just want to tell you, Alan Hans, I said, she needs to go to Alan He says, my wife is taking care of that. They brought her to you, and she found you depressing. And they brought her to you five or six times. And each time, she found you more depressing. 
If there's ever anything that I can do for you, let me know. And whatever you're doing, keep doing it. I couldn't get rid of my deal, so a sponsor said, usually when you stop doing something, God transforms your mind. And since your mind is not being transformed, you go home, oh, what's your name's out of town, lock the door, don't you call me, call anybody else, you stay in there, you and God get rid of that deal. One time they want you to call them, and the next time they want you to call them at all. They don't know what the hell they want. So I went in there and locked myself in there and stayed in there all that day and prayed and cried and hit the couch. I learned to quit hitting the bar. It hurt your hand. And then about 11, 12 o'clock that night, I went to sleep, and the next day that baby was not there. First time in my life I was free of that deal. And I saw this in temple. I went to four meetings. After the fourth meeting, I thought, well, I guess I might as well tell them. So I said, after me, I said, well, I guess I might as well tell you, all we knew it the first night. I said, why don't you tell me? He said, well, you didn't know that you're going to always be the last to know. I said, why is that? He said, we don't know. <laughs> so then, oh, what's the name? After we find out the truth, you know what happens when you have nothing? Just have nothing. You know what nothing is? Nothing. You know how to get sick? Make something out of nothing. So me and old what's her name got a divorce. Then I married again. And I married a Baptist this time. They didn't know anything about alcoholics. And that worked. And then we grew apart. And now I've got a new one. But I don't want you to feel bad towards me because if I'd have started earlier, this probably would have been my sixth. <laughs> So just because I'm not as good as some of them here, it's because I started late. And I really wasn't going to tell this because I'm afraid to tell it. It's the first time in my life I think I really have gotten to where God's given me the right gal. And I've been afraid to tell it. And I thought, well, I'm far enough away from home, I can tell it. And it's a girl that if I had seen ten girls there, she would have been the last one I'd have seen. And I did the best I could to hook her up with another man, and he was so stupid, I just had to go take care of it myself. <laughs> God, I'm glad we're going to have it, aren't you? Wouldn't that have been a shame? As sweet as we are, and we'd have missed it. Well, we didn't miss it. We didn't. I, I just hate it that we can't get the bumper stickers out. We found it. And then they ask us, well, it's an alcoholics and all of us. But isn't that a, wouldn't that have been a shame if you and I had missed it? God, I'd have died if you and I had missed it. But what's so great about it, and not so great, is we found what we were looking for, but we didn't know where to find it. So when we found it, we didn't know we'd found it. So we can't go brag about it. You know, I thought I was out there trying to be something and make something out of myself, and what I was out there doing was preparing myself to be with you. And what you have to do there, you've got to go out there and give it everything you got to become something so you'll end up being nothing. And once you've been nothing, then you can find out what you were looking for all the time. Any idiot should have known that. <laughs> when God says you're only going to be what I am in you, then how is he going to be anything in me if I'm self-sufficient and doing fine? So I've got to become and know and live and experience myself being nothing. It's painful, and I do not like the system. But we got it. We're in it. And that's the way it got here. You had no eye all that time. You was out there having car wrecks, putting up with each other, having fights, getting drunk, falling in ditches, doing all this kind of stuff. You were only doing one thing. You thought you were having trouble and living and doing all. You weren't doing that. You were just properly getting yourself prepared to become what Almighty God wanted you to be. That's all you accomplished. But that was it. And you didn't know where you were going when you got to AA or Al Anon, so it's none of your business where you're going after you get here. 
So quit worrying about it. Don't ever worry about it again, really. And call me and tell me not to do it, too, will you? <laughs> but I'm grateful that God Almighty, in spite of what I thought and what I still think many, many times, knew what he was doing, knew exactly what he was doing, never made a mistake when he made you and I made you exactly the way you needed to be and exactly the way you needed for him to be. And remember what's happened in this room and in rooms all over the country and now all over the world. God picks us out and brings us from every walk of life and puts us in here together that we may go back out and meet together and do exactly what he has for us to do. And I'm glad I know I know a few things about you and I. I'm glad I know I know that up through this minute, you and I are right on time. We're not late. We're not early. We're exactly where God wants us to be in our lives, doing exactly what God wants us to do, without a shadow of a doubt. And I know I know the one thing that I never did know that God's children must know, or they cannot live here without some kind of crutch or some kind of drink or some kind of thing. The thing that I did not know was that God really was my God and that God really did love me and that God did have me in the palm of his hand all of my life. You see, I did everything I could to destroy myself and everything around me. And there wasn't any way I could live like I saw other people living. And that's what I had to experience. So I could come and be sent to you. That I might receive and live in that power with you living in that power. That God may transform my life. That I may become a little more of a death within myself. And let God become a little more in me just like it's happening to you. When anybody walks through that door, not anybody in this room is not going to say without a shadow of a doubt, we've got your answer. Even though many times I think it's not working for me, when that guy and that gal walks through that door, I know we have their answer. And what's so great about it, we can't explain it. What have you got? I have no idea. We just got it. Can you believe that you're going to a program and you don't even know what it is? How does it work? I have no idea, but it works. Can you believe that you're going to go out there and sell a program to somebody? We build our own churches? We can't. Why? You can't say, listen, I want you all to build a church. I've got a new deal. If you'll get up every morning, offer yourself to God, and call another insane person every day to find out what to do, you'll get well. <laughs> And God will come in your life and give you everything you've ever wanted. You think that's going to work? Not going to work. So we're not going to get our church. We're going to have to be just exactly. Can you believe what we are? We're actually living in the thing people strive for all the time. And we just fell into it. We just fell into it. And that Almighty God is our God and has been all the time. We were just cut off till the time came for you and I to begin to live in His kingdom. You know why we didn't fit in here? God's people don't fit in the world. We were never going to fit. God's people are to live in His kingdom on this earth and be sent out to do His deal and never to fit in with the other people. And see, once we don't have to fit, then we fit. No, it's the whole damn thing's backwards. But see, when it's set up by a God who thinks higher than I do, and you do, when he uses no human reasoning, doesn't use psychology, doesn't use anything, when he's our God, he's our only teacher, so he's got to be the teacher, so you can't learn it, memorize it, or anybody teach it to you. And do you know how we had to be that way? Because we wouldn't listen to anybody. 
We never listened to a soul. Nobody could tell us anything. Because you and I must get it from God himself. And he's our director. And he's the guy that guides our life. And he's the guy that has given me the system. Thank God I stayed here no long enough, especially now with 90,000 programs going, that, you know, God, you can go codependent. I did that for years until I got rid of her, you know. And, <laughs> and all this other kind of stuff, which is fine. If you got to go through it, you got to go through it. Just hope you don't get your mind too screwed up. Because this is a tough program because it's for God to be the only teacher, God himself. And that's where we live. And you and I are going to lose some battles after we got here. We won some before we got here, but we lost the game just like we were supposed to. And now we have won that game. And now the only thing that's going to happen to us, girls are going to get prettier. The guys are going to get better looking. And that's all that's going to, we've got to look forward to. Our lives are going to get better. We've got to go through the experience so we can be transformed over and over and over again to where God can give us all the things that he wants us to have and that we can use by him. And 90% of the time, we're going to know what he's doing with us. But now, you and I, right now, live in that power that takes care of everybody's life and overcomes all things. That one power that only God's children have. And you and I have that. And it never fails us. Thank God I stayed with you long enough to feel that God loving me, me loving him back. But the difference was you. It was you. My life was never going to be any different. I could have gone to ten different denominations and a thousand different churches. But my life was never going to be any different until God sent me to be with you and you to be with me. And it never fails us when we call each other. It never fails us when we meet together. And it never fails us when we're out by ourselves. Just like it has been here these last few days, and just like it's been in every meeting, just like it is right now. When I can feel your power that God has given you and the power he's given me, and that one power is when I feel you loving me and me loving you. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.